Three generations of black women operated a highly successful brothel in downtown Carlisle, where powerful white men, including businessmen, judges, and politicians, came to satisfy their desires. Bessie Jones, the last of these operators, I think we could learn a lot from entrepreneurship from her, was found stabbed to death in her bed in October of 1972. She didn't have anybody who was looking out for her best interests. No, because she lived in a white world. They say you play with fire, you get burned. A white prostitute named Georgia Ann Schneider was charged with the murder, kicking off a sensational trial that threatened to scandalize a small town and shake central Pennsylvania to its core. You know how powerful that is? And you saw the knife? Do you think that Georgia Schneider would have had the strength to do that three times? This is the story of Bessie's house. It was the worst kept secret in Carlisle. Everybody knew about Bessie's house. So the combination of history and race, sex and money, I think makes this an absolutely fascinating case. And of course, politics and the secrets of powerful men. I kept the books locked up in my office in a safe. And then when everything was all said and done and I knew that everything was safe, I took them to an area in uh, Harrisburg, a dumping place, and I burned those books and they were destroyed. Never made copies, nothing. Books, described as a record of receipts and sexual preferences. They had zeroed in on Georgia Schneider as the one who did the robbery of the 3,000 and who murdered Bessie. Georgia told me on a Friday and Saturday night, she serviced over 50 men. 50 men? And at that time, uh, Straight intercourse was $10. These girls were making, average-wise, about $600 in cash a week. And all of this happened within two blocks of the courthouse in Carlisle. But Bessie's story actually began a century earlier. Her grandmother, Jane Andrews, was a camp follower, a slave who came north with the Confederate Army, servicing the sexual needs of soldiers. Once she arrived in Pennsylvania during the Gettysburg Campaign, she escaped enslavement and started a business of her own as a free woman that she passed down to her daughter, Cora Andrews, who in turn passed it down to her daughter, Bessie. The owner of that business for the next 100 years was a black woman, which of course in Carlisle was a very unusual situation to have a black businesswoman. Some people would maybe not refer to her as a businesswoman, but she was in fact. She was sort of like out of your way and was not part of the community. Do you know what I'm saying? She kept so far from my perspective in my age, you know, when I came here, you just knew that she had a yellow repute house. That's all you knew. She was a, uh, a pillar of the community in some respects. I mean, it seems a little out of context in that respect, but she was. I mean, she helped black organizations and churches that needed financial help, people that needed financial help. I wouldn't say she had a position in the black community, not that I knew of. Because as I say, she had her business and she just sort of said to herself, I don't know of any, anything that she was visible in the community. Everybody knew her. She was flamboyant in her dress. I just think I saw her coming out of the store and she had like a scarf wrapped around her, her head like, I just saw her passing. And I think somebody said to me that that's Bessie Jones. I said, oh. And one could argue that it took that type of business to be successful in the black community. And that's unfortunate that it was that type of business serving that type of very specific clientele that ended up thriving in a place like Carlisle. Under both Bessie and her mother Cora, the brothel faced raids by the local police. They seldom resulted in anything more than low-level criminal charges and fines. Newspaper reports show the madams and their prostitutes soon posted bail. Every few years, another raid would take place and the house would continue operating. Their clients, of course, never faced any consequences for their patronage. She knew who her clientele was. She only allowed people that she either knew or had been referred to her by people she knew which protected her from undercover police officers, IRS agents, you know, whomever. And that way, 
She controlled the flow of the business. In 1961, at a trial on charges of tax evasion stemming from the Internal Revenue Service, Bessie's attorney, Hyman Goldstein, told the judge that her business was, quote, one of Carlisle's finest old institutions. I believe that Bessie had a working relationship with the Carlisle Police Department. I mean, when, when you look at the situation, she would have to. These occasional raids would have happened because maybe somebody in the community complained. She was able to carry on her business, which was illegal. I could see the irate wife going to the police and saying, I just found out my husband spent you know, last week's paycheck down at Bessie's house. She served the, what I want to say, the, the top clientele. Uh, they said, you know, like judges and lawyers and doctors from out of town would come to her place. None of these men would want to come in and testify. And generally speaking, the police wouldn't want to embarrass them because if one starts talking and then it leads to another and it could lead sort of right up the chain to some very important people. Money was flowing into the black community through someone like Bessie, which helped the black community, so they weren't complaining. I think we could learn a lot from entrepreneurship from, from her and some of the things that she did. This type of business actually had a positive side to it, and it did. Pennsylvania repealed its anti-miscegenation laws in 1780, but interracial sex and marriage were still strong taboos at the time of Bessie's house. Bessie and her predecessors strictly forbid black men from frequenting their establishment, but they did routinely employ black prostitutes for their white clientele. She also knew that there was racist concerns, so she never would allow an African-American man to come to this house to be with one of the girls. They were not allowed in. The students were not allowed in. She knew about marketing back then. She didn't want to anger the police or that kind of a thing, but she had a good thing going. And uh, she didn't want any problems because then she knew the house would probably be closed down. Well, what we know for sure is that many men of substance, financial substance, and also political power came to Bessie's house. Um, we know this because people have admitted it to some extent, but we also know that she kept essentially a log of customers. People keep books when they have a business. <laughs> this was an opportunity for her to keep records that would protect her, especially if and when the day of, a, of some type of raid um, would occur on the, on, the, on the house for the prostitution side as opposed to the IRS side. Well, she had to keep them. That was her, her uh, Bible that carried on her business. And this is the preferred. Well, somebody comes and said, you know, I want brown sugar rather than white sugar. What is it? And I refer to that as girls' names. You know, I want uh, Laura instead of Susie. <laughs> she was there to please her customers. By 1972, Bessie Jones was increasingly isolated. After being convicted of tax evasion by the IRS in 1961, she started keeping money at the house. She was the victim of three armed robberies in the year before her murder. None of them resulted in any arrests. She never lowered her standards when it came to her clientele, but the house was occupied by a revolving door of prostitutes. One of them was Georgia Ann Schneider. The 24-year-old had worked for Bessie before, and had most recently plied her trade in New York City. But, being five months pregnant, she found she could no longer make a living there. She returned to Carlisle on the night of Saturday, September 30th, but didn't work that evening because she felt ill. Early the following morning, Bessie Jones was found dead. There were prostitutes on site, 
She was found stabbed to death in her bed, and uh, it was a brutal killing. A switchblade knife with Bessie's blood, but no fingerprints, was found in the yard at East Locust Street. State police alerted by another prostitute, who claimed Georgia had told her about a plan to rob Bessie, picked up the young woman in a cab heading for her mother's home in Pittsburgh. She had $3,049.07 tucked inside her clothing, money she claimed she earned in New York City, but prosecutors say she robbed from Bessie Jones. I said, do you think you're able to afford private legal counsel? I'm not a public defender, and you would be entitled to get a free attorney. And she said, uh, I don't have any money now, but I can pay you in other ways. Defending Georgia Ann Schneider would be the first big case of Corky Goldstein's career. She said, you're good looking and you're uh, young and uh, I wouldn't charge you. And, I, and I'd also sleep with your, those who aren't her words, but she would also with my investigator. And uh, I said, no, we're, I'm, we're not interested in that. We'll worry about the money later. Uh, don't, that's not something I'm interested in. Schneider would not face the death penalty due to a U.S. Supreme Court decision that threw out such penalties nationwide for several years in the 1970s. But the young woman would spend the rest of her life in jail if convicted. And that wasn't because she wasn't kept or anything like that or because she was pregnant. She was my client, going to be my client. I'm not, you know, that's an ethical violation. The two theories of the case that, that are the only two theories that we have are that uh, uh, Ms. Schneider killed her, took the money and ran. That was sort of the, 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 the simple theory of the case for the Commonwealth when they charged her. The defense, um, who, uh, Corky Goldstein, who represented uh, Schneider, um, opined and put out to the jurors that the syndicate, the New Kensington Syndicate, as it was called, for reasons that maybe aren't exactly clear, but probably knew she had money, and went and basically robbed her of her money. And in doing so, had to kill her because she wouldn't have just casually turned it over. It just would not be her personality. You know, to this day, people believe that there might have been a third possible scenario that didn't involve a syndicate or didn't involve one of the prostitutes, but that particular theory of someone else having done it has never been followed up on, and it has never, certainly not, not been proven. Corky's job, however, was not to solve the murder of Bessie Jones. It was to raise enough reasonable doubt that a jury would choose to acquit Georgia Ann Schneider. Well, you've got to understand, uh, this was in the North, and even though we didn't have slavery, there was still back then uh, a lot of prejudice against uh, black people. Bessie Jones was accepted in the community as a community member. She was treated with great respect. You could see her walking down the street, from what I found out, with very prominent ladies that knew her from the church. From his vantage point, the cards were stacked against him and his client, and he didn't want to do anything that would make his job more difficult. I was asking people, the fact that Georgia Ann Schneider is a prostitute, and was a prostitute, would that in any way put in your mind that she's more likely to do this kind of a crime? And if someone said, well, I don't know, or something like that, I could excuse them. The jury had a lot of people from all over, not just Carlisle, but in Cumberland County. Now, although they knew about the case, and there was a lot of publicity on the radio all the time, on newspapers, everywhere. So it's not, I could, did you ever hear about this case? Uh, what do you know? Were you ever, uh, did you know Bessie Jones? One guy blushed and said, Bleh. so I said, we excused him. And Georgia didn't always help with her own cause. One of the guards there took her in the, downstairs in the basement of the prison 
and said, if you give me oral sex, I'll leave that back door open because she wanted to get out of there because she figured she was going to lose and go to life in prison. So he had nothing to lose. So she said she did give him a uh, oral sex. She went over, the door was open and she went out and she started climbing over the fence. Within three minutes, the guards and everybody jumped and got her and brought her back. So she was gone at that time for about three minutes. One of the prosecution's key witnesses was Sally, another young prostitute who worked for Bessie. Sally's position was that she went up to the room because uh, Bessie said, go up and see how George is doing. And she said she saw what she believed, but she was showed the knife. Yes, that looks like the knife. I saw this knife on her bed, and she told me she was going to rob her. And that was the main thing. That was their theory. She did it, and she ran. Why else would she run if she had nothing to do with it? My theory was to, put you, to show why she left, and that what Sally said was untruthful. They said, and I knew from the autopsy reports, she was brutally stabbed in her heart at least three and a half inches, and three times there was blood all over Bessie. There was blood all over the sheets, all over, it was, this had happened in her bed. There was blood everywhere. But I knew the one question that I, when I cross-examined, did you ever find a fingerprint on this knife that belonged to my client or anybody else? You checked her in all of her clothes. Was there any blood on Georgia Ann Snyder? You checked her whole body. I'm talking her fingernails, her hands, anything. His blood was all over. No, they never found that. You had her in the, in, her, in, in the clothes. You got her clothes. Did you ever find any blood that was inspected, any speck of blood on her clothes? They said no. So there was no physical evidence that they could bring in. And I thought that was good because they had to prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt. If someone was stabbed like that, do you think they would not have blood somewhere? On a shoe, on a clothing, in their nails, somewhere. Because she ran so quickly. And uh, that the jury began, I think, to think, this doesn't make sense from what we had heard. The jurors needed to hear from Ms. Schneider. They needed her to tell them and to be believable, I didn't do this. I am a scared, young, pregnant, white prostitute, but I'm not a killer. I never hurt anybody. I didn't hurt Bessie. The prosecution called a surprise witness, Steve, a black man who testified that he drove Schneider on the night of the killing. In Corky's theory of the case, he also worked for the New Kensington Syndicate. Steve was a black gentleman that, in the theory of the Commonwealth, was a friend of Schneider's, someone who drove her to different places. And in the theory of Corky and his client, was part of the new Kensington syndicate that ran a house of ill repute himself and actually helped bring girls in and out, including to Bessie's and other places. Commonwealth brought him in to basically say, you know, she contacted this guy to get help getting out after she committed the, the murder. And uh, Corky knew what he was going to say. Wasn't he was surprised that they brought him in as a witness, but he was ready to, 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 to cross-examine him and, and did, I, I believe, a, an excellent job with it. Georgia Ann Snyder gets a fair trial. This was more circumstantial. No one saw what happened here. No one saw what happened here. Do you saw the knife? Do you think that Georgia Snyder would have had the strength to do that three times, and all the blood that they talked about, they talked about all the blood splashing over the bed and the sheets and all over Bessie and everything. Not one speck of blood was ever found on any of her clothes, in her fingernails, nothing. 
So you can assume you would have seen blood, something. So there was no physical evidence on her. Corky won that round. Um, he was knowledgeable. He did his homework. He worked very hard at it. And he is a particularly talented uh, defense lawyer. His closing argument was incredible. And it really tied together the case and laid out a lot of doubt. You heard what Georgia said, and you have to decide the credibility of witnesses. You saw Sally talking up there. She never admitted that she was a prostitute at the house. But you know she was by the different answers that she gave. She said she stayed at the house and all that. She was a prostitute in the house, our opinion. And she mumbled and fumbled and all that. Georgia, on the other hand, sat there, looked right at you. You had a chance to listen. The district attorney asked her many questions over cross-examination. Did you ever hear once a mistake? Why did she run? She was scared, like anybody else. She didn't know if they were going to come after her or come back for her, so she ran. I thank you. I thank you. And I know you have a duty to do what you think is best. The district attorney did an excellent job, but they did not prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. But there are two pieces of evidence that the jury in 1973 never heard about. Bessie kept a book because at her time, she, wa she had to give receipts to people who paid cash. Some didn't want a receipt. But she made one out anyway. If they didn't want it, they could throw it in the trash. But she was a businesswoman, so she gave them a receipt. So that was a receipt book. And then because there were so many regulars, very prominent people, whether they be state senators, state reps, whether they be uh, other prominent citizens from all around or coming in from uh, other areas around here, she had called it a preference book. John Smith, for example, who was a regular, that's the name. What kind of sex John Smith liked? What was his interest? Did he like two girls? Did he like this or like that? Did he want uh, straight intercourse? Did he want other things, whatever? But I guess what I'm saying is that was the preference book. When Georgia was running, because she had heard all this commotion, saw Bessie with all the blood and dead, she said, I gotta get out of here. She had the ability to think, if they think it's me, if I get if something happens to me, if I have these books, no one would want their names exposed. And it's just, so she said, I'm going to take these books. So I'll have them in case that will help me bargain, you know, because they don't want the books that. They never took the books. And when I came to visit her the first time, after we decided I was going to represent her, she said, I want to give you something. And she said, here are these books. And she explained what they were. And she said, keep them, please keep them, because we might need them, or you might need them, Attorney Goldstein, to try and bargain with them about this. Because I don't think they'd want all these names, because there's some prominent names all over this. When approached with the ledgers, then Cumberland County District Attorney Harold Shealy, known as Jake to his colleagues, claimed they were not relevant to the case. Shealy died in 2013. And he said, what are you going to do with them? I said, when the trial is over, I will destroy the books. No one will ever see these books. I don't know how it got out. Maybe she said something to someone in the prison who said something to somebody. Because then I started getting calls in my law office from families, a few state senators, some reps, some other prominent people that I knew or maybe their wives or, or their children, maybe they had been tied. I said, Mr. Goldstein, we know you have these books. What do you intend to do? And I said, they will never see the light of day. They won't come up in the trial. I will never, ever release these books. They will be destroyed. My investigator at the time was, Paul, was Phil Costable. And I, Phil said he wanted to read the books. And he was my investigator, I let him read it. And he said, you know, Corky, even at that time, he said, 
you could make a lot of money by having these books. Jake Shealy was a most honorable man, and he was not interested, and the investigators understood. They didn't want to ruin people's reputations or have a receipt book with their names or preferences. There were so many names, and we're talking about books like this. I mean, there were so many names. They had their theory to look through that and find a name. Someone who just went to this uh, house of prostitution. Th what was the link that now they could have found a name of someone that they knew was a, a robber or a, a someone who was, they knew the name, you know, looking for those names. So they might have worked with that. But they, I don't think their thinking went that far. It was just that we have our case. We know who did this. That's what I think they believed. The books would only hurt, and they saw no reason to go any further. I think their one theory, Georgia, and honing in on her, and everything that was brought out, I think they too began to see if someone is stabbed very hard three times with blood splattered all over the bed and all over everything, and someone stabbing, boom, 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 and all this blood, they would have got something on their hands. When they used Steve to testify, and it, it came out that Steve, on the stand, indicated that he got to pick her up at the bus station, and he was told what to do, uh, how to pick her up, and uh, he tried to say up there he, he was just in drywall, and I think they could have followed up more with Steve and checked him and got his clothes and seen if there was any blood on him. But they never did that. I mean, Steve became a prosecution witness. Not a way with murder. And probably a lot of money. I don't know that I would say that the prosecutors were wrong. I think. What happens many times in cases is that when you're looking at something from a law enforcement perspective and what you're seeing makes sense with what you believe, and in this case, fleeing prostitute, thousands of dollars, you know, I'm out of here, this woman's killed. I think that that led all of them to what they believe was the inescapable conclusion that this young lady had done this. I, I guess any time you have an unsolved homicide, one could argue there's injustice to the family. If I believed that there was some nefarious attempt or conspiracy to keep this crime from being solved, then I would believe there was injustice. I don't think there's anything about this case that lends itself to a theory that the case was thrown. I am sure that institutionally, Jake Shealy and the prosecutors and the investigators and the police officers were trying to do justice for Betsy. I really do believe that. The police stopped here because it was so obvious, but a good investigation would have actually taken them over here and they would have discovered the real culprit. I don't think I would have done anything different other than, again, I would have loved to see the books. I would have enjoyed that. Just to, just to get a sense of volume, if nothing else. Um, but it'd be curious to, to see if I recognize some names. The young people in Colorado don't even know anything about this story. Because people don't talk about it. Do you think that we can look up to her as a role model? Well, it all depends uh, on what you think of, of that business. And I would not because that's, to me, that is, that is wrong. That, that is, you know, that's not a part of, 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 of my lifestyle and it's nothing that I would, would uh, honor in any way. So I can use that as a role model. No, not at all. That would not be an honorable um, business for me. So I, I could not look positive at that. It was, um, you know, certainly 
a good money-making uh, business. I'm looking at it from my upbringing and my lifestyle. That's what I'm looking at it at. I mean, I have to agree, you know, she would have never made that money doing housework. Not at all. Little remains of Bessie's world today. Her house was torn down and is now a parking lot. Most of the key players in her murder are themselves long dead. The cemetery plot she shares with her mother, her brother, and her sisters is seldom visited. The only other physical reminder of her place in Carlisle society is a fur coat kept in a climate-controlled room at the Historical Society. But her story deserves to be told. Over the course of a century, Jane Andrews, Cora Andrews, and Bessie Jones built a thriving business and exerted a power all their own. In an era of racism and subjugation, Bessie donned this fur coat and walked the streets of Carlisle with her head held high.